is 50 years since the beginning of a period of history in Chile that saw over 3,000 people killed or missing and around 200,000 fleeing into exile. A regime known for torture, persecution and the violent suppression of any opposition. 50 years then since Chile's military junta came to power, headed by Augusto Pinochet. In 1973, as the country faced an acute economic crisis and social unrest, Salvador Allende was ousted in the military coup backed by the US. Pinochet then appointed president his mantra, national reconstruction. We didn't want to take control of this country. But since the moment that we did, we have put all our energy into moving forward and bringing order back to the country. Pinochet's 17 years in power saw the country transformed into a liberalised worldwide economy. But into the 80s, as the country agreed to a new constitution, the process, seen by many as neither free nor fair, armed opposition grew with more and more national protests. In 1988, Pinochet lost a plebiscite on whether to agree to a new eight-year term for him, elections then leading to Patricio Alwyn taking charge in 1990. Pinochet himself was arrested in London in 1998 at the request of Spain, but extradition refused on medical grounds. He returned to Chile a year and a half later, but was never charged, and he died in 2006, aged 91. As the country grapples again with rewriting the constitution brought in in 1980 under Pinochet, Juliette Chagnon and Guillaume Gazalbes revisit Pinochet's Chile for France 24. Patricia Espejo can never forget the morning of the 11th of September 1973. As one of the president's private secretaries, she was alerted at 7 in the morning of a military coup. She immediately went to the Palacio de la Moneda. I arrived with Tati, Allende's daughter. She managed to get in. I was arrested straight away. There was a small tank, a police vehicle, they arrested the people protecting Allende, and they were then shot. In the space of a few hours, the army, led by General Pinochet, took control of the presidential palace. Salvador Allende asked his family to leave and decided to stay alone in his office. At that point, we understood there was no way out. Right up to the end, I didn't believe that there could be such intense shelling. The cornered president refused to surrender and instead took his own life. Here we're in front of the Mirande door, the door which the president normally used and through which he passed one final time, dead, after his suicide. The door remained closed under Pinochet because it was a symbol of democracy. All elected presidents entered through here. For Patricia and the supporters of the Popular Unity Alliance, the coup was a terrible shock. This left-wing movement, bringing together communist and socialist with Allende at its head for three years, had been working to transform Chilean society. Historically, Chile had been a very unequal country, where a single social class held most of the capital and was extremely powerful both in economic and ideological terms. The popular unity government offered the people an opportunity, an opportunity for dignity and to be considered as human beings. There was widespread repression from the very first days of the dictatorship. Hundreds of prisoners were rounded up and taken to the national stadium. A place of sinister memories for former prisoners like Manuel Mendez Sayoa. What happened was that on the 12th of September, Pinochet and all the armed forces went into the streets, into universities, colleges, 
offices, factories, and all the people inside were arrested. Prisoners were locked up in the showers and changing rooms of the stadium. Every available space was requisitioned. Between 7,000 and 20,000 detainees passed through here during the first months of the dictatorship. Inis Ponjon was one of them. The student and communist activist was among those arrested a few days after the coup. This was my changing room. There were women in every changing room. We slept on the floor. It was very cold. We had to leave a small passage so that the soldiers would come and get us in the night to take us to the torture and interrogation rooms. Sometimes some of our comrades left and never returned. After the widespread repression of the first few months, the dictatorship set up a network of 452 detention, torture and execution centres across the country. The regime's political police, the DINA, transformed La Villa Grimaldi on the outskirts of Santiago into a clandestine centre for more targeted repression. Miguel Montesinos, who was 21 at the time, was one of its victims. I was in this cell with two other comrades. Those two people are missing to this day. The regime locked up MIR revolutionary militants as well as socialist and communist party members in this tower. Miguel is one of the few who survived. The idea behind the torture and all the other punishments inflicted by the dictatorship was to extensively wipe out opposition organizations. Of course, those who suffered the most repression were left-wing parties, or as they called them, the Marxist parties. They spoke of the Marxist scourge, the communists. They saw all opponents as communists. When the Dina left the site in 1978, it destroyed most of the buildings, which were later rebuilt thanks to Miguel's descriptions and his drawings. Over 17 years of dictatorship, almost 200,000 Chileans were forced into exile. Over 40,000 people are officially recognized to have been imprisoned and tortured, including more than 3,000 dead or missing. Juan Luis Rivera's Matu detained and missing from the 6th of November, 1975. Gabby Rivera was only a child when her father, a trade union leader, disappeared. My mother, brother and I searched for him everywhere, at the morgue, health centres, hospitals and other places of detention. We were told everywhere, no, he's not here. In the early 2000s, the army claimed that all the disappeared had been thrown into the sea. But bones belonging to Gabby Rivera's father were finally found in a former detention centre. A rare case. More than a thousand families in Chile have been left wondering the fate of their loved ones. We absolutely have to find these missing people now because there's no time left. We're all getting older. Our mothers are dead. Many people who were responsible are also dying. We'll never find out the truth if we don't hurry up and decide to act and set priorities for the government. A national search plan for the missing has been launched by the current left-wing government. But associations are also calling for military archives to be made accessible. This request has so far been refused by the state and the army. Fifty years after the coup, one legacy of the dictatorship still divides people, the 1980 Constitution. An initial attempt led by the left to amend it in favour of a more progressive text failed. 
The second constitutional process is now in the hands of the right. A defeat for the left, but also an important step for the country, according to this socialist MP. This will allow us to say to ourselves that we've finished with this discussion on the constitution and we can move on to something else. I do think there are specific articles that still need to be removed. Despite several rewrites, the constitution retains the pillars of the dictatorship, private health, education and pension systems and limited trade union rights. The Chilean oligarchy were completely behind the dictatorship. The ruling class are now, in a way, fighting to defend that legacy. Pinochet privatized state companies that still belong to the richest people in Chile. It's not right that in our country things that happened 50 years ago should continue to take up so much space. Not far from the former Congress, a few dozen protesters are out on the street. Far-right sympathizers opposed to the current government. For some of them, it's an opportunity to demonstrate their allegiance to the dictatorship. Commemorating 50 years means wanting to sow discord and stir up hatred so that people hate each other. In Allende's time, people were queuing up to buy just 250 grams of sugar. There was no violence here. We simply had to maintain order. But we lived in peace under Pinochet. It was a peaceful country. The most extreme of these supporters even go as far as to deny the dictatorial nature of Pinochet's regime. Saying he was a dictator is wrong. The dictators are in Venezuela. Nicaragua, Cuba. Allende was the dictator. He was evil. Communists are evil. According to a recent opinion poll, more than a third of Chileans believe that the coup freed the country from Marxism. Nearly half believe that the dictatorship had both good and bad sides. A perspective that overlooks any human rights violations in favor of the regime's liberal policies, which were responsible for the country's economic development. This historian says there's nothing surprising about this. Let's remember that Pinochet ended his time in power with a population that supported him by almost 40 percent. The vote of the hard right, which had previously identified with Pinochet and which generally remains loyal to him, has never fallen below 35 percent. This opinion, which used to be hidden, which people would never once dare to admit, has today become more common in a reactionary context. But the majority of the population still sees Pinochet as a dictator and that there were systematic violations of human rights. There are deep divisions in Chilean society surrounding this anniversary, but the current socialist government still hopes to unite supporters critical of its governance in a memorial campaign. Dozens of events are planned throughout the year. The commemoration aims to continue the work of remembrance that began with the return to democracy. In 15 years, three separate truth, reparation and reconciliation commissions have been set up. In 2010, this process culminated in the opening of the Santiago Museum of Memory and Human Rights, visited by more than 150,000 people every year. This date, the 11th of September 1973, marked a turning point in the history of Chile. Although the military had intervened in politics over the course of the 20th century, there had never been a coup of such intensity. Under the orders of the military junta led by Pinochet, they made plans to expel, torture or murder anyone considered to be an internal enemy. 
Some time ago, I would have said that the dictatorship was behind us and hadn't played such an important role in Chile. But I wasn't fully aware of what had really happened and how it had happened. At home, yes, the subject sometimes comes up, but it generates conflict. Because we all have different opinions on the subject and everyone brings the story back to their own experiences, so it generates conflict. The battle for memory still rages in Chile, where many civilians collaborated with the military regime. Associations say justice has not yet been served. Of more than 700 soldiers and civilians convicted, less than 100 have served their sentences. General Pinochet, arrested in London on the 16th of October 1988 with a view to a trial in Spain, died in Chile eight years later without ever facing justice. Julian Chagnon and Guillaume Casalbes revisiting Pinochet's Chile for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Of course, you can catch it and the previous editions as well on our website at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.